Okay, we might be short today because I forgot to fill my water glass. And all I've got is last week's water, which I don't really want to drink. So. First Corinthians chapter, or Second Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look to the Lord in the word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus. Do you measure up? You know, that's a question that we ask ourselves as we're driving into work. Sometimes going to work is a stressful thing. And those of you who are retired, you can think back and, and, and reflect upon some of those stresses. that are waiting, things that are, are weighing you down, do you measure up? And, and do you have the qualifications necessary to fulfill your dreams? Do I? How do we know? Society, that's why we have education. Education is probably the first thing we look at and look for is to see if to answer that question. Do I measure up? Education and experience. Is it experience, of course, being another another metric that we use to, to answer that question? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? The, first, in the, the Corinthians are Paul's contacts. And, and one of the ways that, that we measure if we're good enough is we look at our references and, they, and we might say, well, will you, will you be a reference on this for me in the future? I know that in the past I've contacted some of my co-workers, some of my supervisors, and asked if I could use them as job references. But another way to look at what Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture is, is that Paul is, in a sense, using his networking contacts. And these are all terms that are familiar to those of you who are bouncing around in the job world or in the job market, those of you who are going to college and so on, you, you start thinking in these terminologies. But the question that Paul asks in chapter 3, verse 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some letters, epistles or letters of recommendation, as it says in the NIV? Letters of recommendation. To you or from you. And as it says in the New King James, do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation or letters of commendation from you? And, and, and that's the question that Paul is asking, and I'm guessing that, that, that Paul had been questioned about his qualifications. Have you ever been questioned about your qualifications? That's what's taking place in the elections now, isn't it? Each candidate is accusing the other candidate of not being qualified or not being fit for the job of the President of the United States. And of course, that's for us as the voters to decide come next November. But the Corinthians are Paul's contacts. There is, there is networking contacts. And, and perhaps someone asked for Paul's qualifications or letters of recommendation. Who are you? Where, where did you come from? Why are you here? And Paul says, he says, you yourselves are my letter, are our letter, he says, he's, he's speaking in the plural, 
Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, and not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. And what this passage is ultimately teaching us, as, as Paul delves deeper into this, and he moves on to, 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 to transition into the issue that this, this, this message really, really lays upon us, is that what is our sufficiency or what is our qualification? What are your qualifications or your sufficiency as a Christian? As you stand before God, what are your qualifications? And to be honest with you, we don't, none of us have a resume before God. Not a one of us has any kind of standing. Not a one of us has enough job experience. Not a one of us has enough education in our standing before God. I happened to check something that was a little bit disturbing this week, and, and uh, as I said, I'm trying to limit the articles and some of the some of the news newsy things that, that come across my desk because it, it it kind of makes the guy a little bit just too discouraged. You can kind of overdo some of that stuff that comes across the 24-7 news cycle. And uh, some of us, and some of you perhaps, are in the same boat. We need to step back and, 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 and turn off some of these things. But one of the things that I can't get out of my head is, is, is some new data about, about who are the unchurched. And this, this one statistic said, that 43% of people that are unchurched never or rarely think about what's going to happen to them when they die. 43% of, of this group that's considered unchurched never or rarely think about what's going to happen to them when they die. Well, why is that troubling? Well, this is a group of people that are that are first of all they, they don't go to church, so that's 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 the pool that we're swimming in here. They don't go to church, and they rarely think about what's going to happen after they die. How about you? Do you think about what's going to happen to you after you die? What is God going to do with me? Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? A lot of people might just naturally assume, well, I, I, I'm going to go to heaven. And that's what we learn in, this, in, in, in a lot of the uh, media and the, the movies that are, that are, that are portrayed. That you have these near-death experiences, and where does everybody go? They always see this bright light. Of course, that's not always a good thing either. Could be a locomotive. But they always see a bright light. Is that really what, what the average person should expect? Is that what the Bible tells us, that, that most people can expect a wonderful afterlife? Is that what the Bible teaches? 43% never given a thought, never think, think never or rarely about what's going to happen after they die. Which then, as Christians, it causes us to reflect and to kind of uh, reevaluate how we converse with people on a day to day basis. What's going to motivate the average person to surrender and submit to the Lord? If they never think about what's going to happen to them when they die. And I know it's easy for young people as a young, you know, when, when, when I was younger, depending on my perspective, depending on who's listening, I used to think that life would go on forever. Let's just, let's just agree that I'm in middle age. I used to think that life would go on forever. 
And I used to think that, that it would take it would take a long, long time that that before I'd get old. And never have to think about what would happen after I died. But sadly, we know that young people die. God forbid their young people do not always live to old age. What is going to happen to you, young person, after you die? Where are you going to spend eternity? You know, the Corinthians, as we said, are Paul's contacts. And Paul is expressing his love for them. They are his references in the world. Paul says, I don't need any letters. This group is my references. They are my letters of recommendation. And then he goes on to talk about what is what makes us sufficient. And that's found in verse 5 of our text. This is also an interesting text because of Paul's use of the word stone tablets in glory, which we'll get into a little bit. Sufficiency before God is the main question here. And that we find that through Christ, we are sufficient. Christ is all the sufficiency we need. So Paul's reflecting upon his travels as we look into this text. That's basically what he's doing. He says in chapter 2, he's talking about some of his travels. And... Uh, uh, in chapter 3, then, he, he, he leads us into this subject. But in, in, in this passage, through verses 3 to 11, as we read it in our, in, our, in our reading, we notice three things that Paul, Paul brought up. First of all, he makes a legal comparison, verses 5 through 11. He says, not that we are sufficient in and of ourselves to think anything of as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of what he calls a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Here we see a comparison between the covenants. And I wrote some of these things down as Paul, Paul these are all in this passage of scripture. He is making a comparison. These must be Jewish background readers here in Corinth. Uh, there must have been a lot of Jews dispersed throughout the Middle East there. And he says, and the old covenant brings death, the new covenant brings life in the spirit. The old covenant was written on tablets, the new covenant was written on our hearts. The old covenant had a sense of glory, but the new covenant is even more glorious. And he says, the old covenant is passing away, and the new covenant is permanent. And that's the comparison that we have that Paul makes in this text. And it's really quite interesting as, as to this discussion of the relationship to the, of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. The Old Covenant, of course, that he's referring to is the Mosaic Covenant. Now we know that there are many covenants that were made in the Old Testament. We have the Noah, the Abraham, to mention a couple, the Davidic, the Davidic Covenant. And, uh, and, of course, the Mosaic Covenant. I believe there's seven covenants that are total in the Old Testament. But Paul is specifically, it's easy for me to say, talking about the Mosaic Covenant here because he's referring to the tablets. You remember the story of Moses coming down the mountain. And so Paul is making that comparison. He is saying that God has made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant, not of a letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Well, the second thing we see here is loving affection, verses 1 through 4. We've kind of already implied that, that, that Paul had a loving affection for the people of Corinth. It is a loving relationship between themselves. What kind of relationships exist? between the brethren, what, what kind of relationships exist in our church, in, in our communities? Is there a difference between your relationship to your Christian brothers and sisters in Christ and your the, the rest of our communities and even our families? I believe there ought to be a difference. 
My relationship to my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ are precious to me in a very special way. And, and so often Christians today, and this is important, something to know, that I believe firmly that your relationship to your Christian brothers and sisters needs to be a unique relationship. Not just passing strangers, not just ships passing in the night. And that if your relationships with your Christian brothers and sisters in Christ are, are not the strongest relationships you have, you, you need to question what is going on in your life. They need to be the strongest. Now, I'm not saying that they need to be, need to be stronger necessarily than, than blood relationships. But sometimes your Christian friends are going to be closer than your blood relatives, especially if, if, if our blood relatives do, are unbelievers. You run into that. You might think, oh, Pastor, that's blasphemy. But what if your blood relatives are not all believers in Christ? And you find your fellowship. Some people are persecuted in their own home. I was. At least very subtly. I had to leave my family. When I was 18, 19, 20 years old. Because all that I heard. You know, for when, 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 when people would get together. Was just criticism and cynicism. About spiritual things. And I had to look for and go to my Christian brothers and sisters where I could be built up in the faith. Some people grow up in that kind of family. And if that's the case, then my Christian brothers and sisters become closer to than, than my blood brothers and sisters. That happens. So if you've got a situation where your blood relatives are also brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a wonderful scenario. Loving affection between the brethren. Jesus says they will know you are Christians by your love. They will know you are Christians by your love. If you just tolerate, if you just tolerate your fellow Christians, there's a problem. Thirdly, a glorious sufficiency. Paul talks about the glory. And he says there was greater glory in the new covenant, but he says that unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could look steadily at the, at, at, at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, Paul says in verse 14, for until this day the same veil remains. But he talks about the glory of of, of the new covenant, which is, which is much greater. Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Which raises the question, where is the glory in the church? Where is the glory in, 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 in our worship services? Where is the fire? You know, in Solomon's day, when the, Solomon finished the temple, and all of his singers and all of the people were done with all the hammering and the nailing. And they were, they were meeting for the first time. The glory of the Lord descended in the temple of such power that they had to stop and they had to physically leave the building. Where is the glory? So many of us have gotten used to to serving a lifetime and never seeing the glory of God. Oh, we need the glory. That's what Brother John was talking about, a religious revolution, a religious revival. We need to see God's glory. God's glory in our churches. Well, the good news is, is that we do measure up and we qualify. We are sufficient because of repentance, faith, and or, or what faith is, is childlike trust in the life and death of the resurrected Christ. Well, as we close, who are you trying to please? Another question of examination, do you have a loving affection for the brethren? 
and are you sufficient? Which covenant are you trusting in your sufficiency? So many of us try to base our sufficiency on the old covenant, the legal, the laws. We might not even know, know the old covenant very well, but we base our sufficiency on it. Are you trusting in the right covenant this morning? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh God, for this day in which we can hear your word with, without freedom, or with freedom, and without worry. Oh dear God, continue to speak to our hearts, we pray. In 